Hello, and welcome to week four of FINA H111, the history of Bart 1, prehistory to medieval. Uh, I'm Aaron Schwartz again, and in our week four lecture, we're going to be looking at the works of the ancient Aegean uh, as sort of a precursor build up to ancient Greece. Um, we'll get into a little bit of the history of archaeology in the region. Uh, some of the importance of the myths and mythology that are coming out of uh, these cultures, uh, and considering that as a foundation for uh, classical Greece to come afterwards. So, with that, let's move on and dive right into the Aegean. So as we look at this map, giving us a, a sense of where we are geographically, we we'll want to consider what we know about the ancient Aegean uh, and how we've come to find this information. It was the archaeologist Heinrich Schliemann uh, who was inspired by the Iliad and the Odyssey and wanted to find proof that the battles and scenes depicted in those epics uh, actually took place. So in the 1870s he set out looking for the historical city of Troy uh, and we were eventually able to discover the city of Troy and you can see it here uh, on this map. <clears throat> uh, we know that there was human activity in the Aegean region uh, as early as Paleolithic times. Uh, we do know that uh, as they moved into Neolithic civilizations, there was some sort of a writing system. We understand very little of those writing systems, uh, but this entire place and the culture and the mythologies that developed in the Aegean will be essential to the development of the mythology uh, and artistic styles of ancient classical Greece. In this area, we'll be looking at three major cultures, uh, the Cycladics, uh, the Minoans, and the Mycenaeans. Uh, they are in three slightly different but overlapping geographic regions of the, My uh, of the Aegean Sea, uh, and they each had distinctive cultures and uh, distinctive art forms associated with them. Uh, this little timeline here is just a basic rough understanding of the chrono chronology when these uh, when these civilizations seem to be thriving in the region. The Cycladic is the earliest civilization we'll be looking at from about 2800 to 1600 BCE. The Minoans come after that and then the Mycenaeans will be on mainland Greece and will have a great deal of influence on the development of early mainland Greek culture. So we're going to start in the Cyclades and look at some of the artistic artifacts that we find uh, amongst the Cycladic culture. So we're going to begin in the Cyclades, which is a small group of islands in the se central southern part of the Aegean Sea. It formed a virtual land bridge between mainland Greece and Asia Minor. Uh, the largest island in the group was Naxos. Um, I'm going to give you just a little bit of information about the phases of Cycladic culture. Your book will have a little bit more about this. I'm not going to get into a lot of detail. Um, I'll just give you a, a basic outline of these phases of Cycladic history. Uh, in the Cycladic I phase, uh, information from this period comes almost exclusively from cemeteries. Settlements remain scarce. Uh, and this could just be because they were using perishable materials like wood to build their settlements, so it just didn't last for us to discover it. Uh, in this time period, the craft of carving marble starts to develop, and the first marble vessels and schematic figurines begin to appear. And we'll take a look at a couple of those here in just a moment. The Cycladic II phase was the height of Cycladic culture. Existing settlements seem to have expanded and new ones were being established, so we see an expansion of culture into previously unoccupied areas, a trend that was also paralleled in mainland Greece and in Crete during the same time period. Uh, 
A new type of earth-cut grave with a lateral entrance was introduced in the Cyclades to be used for multiple burials. The most characteristic feature of the Cycladic II period was the impressive development of marble carving. At the same time, contacts with mainland Greece and Crete and the north and northeast Aegean increased considerably. So during the second phase of Cycladic culture, we get increased sophistication in cultural practices and also, probably not coincidentally, increased contact with other cultures in the region. The Cycladic III phase uh, will see major changes taking place in the islands, the most noticeable being the abandonment of many habitations and burial sites and the construction of fortifications uh, in several of the surviving settlements. Similar changes were observed in mainland Greece and the Anatolian coast during the, the same time period, reflecting a widespread phenomenon of unrest and instability all over the Aegean. So some scholars interpret these disturbances as the result of migration and the arrival of new populations into the Aegean, possibly from Asia Minor. In the course of this troubled period, the art of marble carving began to decline in the Cyclades, really dying out at the end of the 3rd millennium BCE. So we have political instability, which will directly affect the production of the arts uh, and directly interrupt the uh, aesthetic and cultural traditions of the region, which seems to lead to the ultimate fall and decline of Cycladic culture overall. So let's take a look at a few of the objects that we do have left behind from the Cyclades. So here we're seeing a Cycladic figurine carved out of marble, per, uh, approximately one and a half uh, feet long or tall, uh, in a female shape. Now, we discovered these objects in different uh, burial sites, funerary sites, across the Cyclades. This one is from Syros. Uh, we've dated this one to approximately 2500 BCE, and it's very... Uh, it's very endemic of the type of figurine that we find in the Cycladic area at this time. Now, what it was used for is largely uh, a matter of contention. There's a lot of theories. Uh, given its relationship to funerary rites, this could possibly be uh, some sort of dedication or idol, perhaps a representation of the deceased. Uh, that certainly wouldn't be an unheard of practice. Um, some have figured that maybe these have been used in shrines and were therefore imbued with certain properties, um, some way to access the spirit realm or afterlife. That's also a possibility. Uh, but what I want to get us paying attention to here is I'd like for you to take a close look at how this figure is abstracted. It's obviously a human figure. We can make out that much. Uh, but I want you to pay attention to the features of the body that are being distorted and abstracted here so that we can try to make some sort of supposition on why it may be distracted in that way. Uh, we're seeing a certain elongation of the form, a simplification of the body into basic geometric shapes. We're seeing in a closed off uh, um, position of the body. By that I mean the arms are clasped around the waist. The legs are, have been separated but are still close together joined at the ankles. There may be very practical reasons for this. We simply don't want extended uh, appendages that could possibly be broken off. Uh, but there may also be another symbolic element to the positioning of the arms, the positioning of the legs, and where these might have been found in the shrine um, or the burial site. So take a moment to jot down some ideas in your notes about the way that this is abstracted and how it affects your ability to understand the piece. Um, some of the pieces that we found did have painted features on them. We do have evidence of some paint left behind, but for the most part the paint has chipped away over the centuries. Uh, so take a moment to consider why an artist might want to abstract the form in this way. And then we'll move on to the next slide. Here's a different image. Uh, it's a different figurine, obviously. 
Uh, and I won't say too much more about this uh, because we can see that it is also a highly abstract piece. It's approximately the same size. Um, I would like you to note the ways that this is similar to in composition and abstraction to the first piece that we looked at, but also how is it different from. Uh, that's going to give us an indication perhaps of individual artist style, personal style, uh, which which gives us an indication of uh, the overall cultural style and the diversity that was allowed within that cultural uh, purview. It suggests to us that there was perhaps a little bit of leeway with artists on how they represented these figures, uh, which may suggest to us something about how they functioned within society. Not all the figurines we find in the Cyclades are of reclining figures with their arms clasped around their waist. Uh, some are like this, uh, musicians. So this appears to be a male lyre player. A lyre is a type of harp that you can see this uh, figurine has uh, from Kyros. Uh, we date it to about 2700 to 2500 BCE. He's also carved out of marble. He's only about 9 inches high. Uh, it's some beautiful techniques, some wonderful work being done there, where we see the intricate nature with which his back has been separated from the back of the chair, the decoration of the chair, the construction of it. Um, the hands have broken off of the piece, but we could probably get a, an idea, an indication, if we use our imagination, of where the hands would have been placed uh, to try to show this musician playing this harp. So the function of these pieces, again, there's a certain level of debate as we try to interpret the archaeological sites where we have found them. Uh, this is most likely indicative of some sort of musical ritual or music that may have been played during funerary ceremonies. Um, or perhaps it's just a, a decorative piece. That could well be the case as well. Um, <clears throat> so there's going to be a certain amount of uh, speculation that goes on because we do not have good written records, historic records from the Cyclades to try to place these things and categorize them. Uh, but our male figure here is also highly abstract uh, in these sort of geometric voluminous shapes. So again I'd like you to pay attention to the way that the shapes uh, are abstracted, the way the figure is abstracted, how it's uh, related to or different from the previous pieces we were just looking at. Uh, and then once you've uh, sort of jotted down your ideas on that, we're going to move on to the Minoans and take a look at the island of Crete. Now let's move to Minoan Crete. Crete is a rather large island in the southern part of the Aegean Sea. And in this particular map we have several of the palace sites and tombs that are marked on the island here. Um, where we get the word Minoan and a lot of the, what we associate with Minoan culture uh, has to do with the ancient myth of King Minos. Uh, the story of Minos, the labyrinth, Theseus, and Ariadne is a Bronze Age Greek myth. Uh, we do know that there was a real king in the city of Gnosos who built a temple that probably inspired the legend of the labyrinth. And what's very interesting about the relationship of Crete to Greece and the Minoan culture as it relates to mainland Greek culture, um, the Minoans, their culture thrived before classical Greece. Uh, Bronze Age and early Greek uh, settlers and early Greek civilization, they were exploring out into the Aegean and into the Mediterranean. They found many of these old settlements, uh, many of these much older sites, and found these ruins and were trying to make sense of what they were seeing, which were in many cases these extremely large, very complex palaces, uh, very large uh, storage structures, burial sites, and they were trying to figure out where this had come from. Um, and so it formed the foundation of many what are now well-known Greek mythology, Greek myths. 
Um, and King Minos is the primary example. So as I said, there was a real king in the city of Knossos who built a temple that was probably uh, the inspiration for the myth of the labyrinth. Uh, the term Minos may have been a title that the ruler actually held, not his name. Now we do know that religion played an important role in Minoan Crete, and many activities and artistic products revolved around religious cults. Religious celebrations usually took place in sacred caves, uh, on sanctuaries and mountain peaks, and in the palaces and villas, which all had their own uh, interior sanctuaries. The sacrifice of the bull uh, and games like uh, bull jumping and bull fighting uh, that revolved around the animal were central parts of, religion, of Minoan religious festivals, symbolizing perhaps man's interaction with powerful natural elements and ultimately his triumph over them through skill and power. Um, so, it's a very interesting connection, what we know factually, historically, from uh, Minoan culture, and how much it's been influenced by Greek mythology. And I'll tell you a little bit more about the story of King Minos, uh, this legendary story, as we look at the next slide. Here we're looking at the ruins of the Palace of Knossos, which we think inspired the myth of the labyrinth. So uh, let me tell you a little bit of Greek mythology. Uh, according to legend, Minos was a mighty king and a great warrior. He was rumored to be the son of the Greek god Zeus and the mortal woman Europa. Uh, he had three children, and Androgeus, Ariadne, and Phaedra. His very splendid labyrinthine palace at Knossos was built to by him, built for him, rather, by the great genius uh, Daedalus. Although he was a great man, Minos was also flawed. Uh, one day, a magnificent white bull appeared in his kingdom. The god Poseidon demanded that the bull be sacrificed to him, but Minos thought it was such a great creature that he decided to keep it for himself and sacrifice another animal in his place. This made the gods angry, and they decided to punish Minos by making his wife uh, fall in love with the bull. Mad with desire, she sought the help of Daedalus, who created a mechanical cow in which she could hide and approach the bull. I won't go into any more detail of that myth, but the end result of it is a mythical creature known as a minotaur, uh, half man, half bull. Uh, and yes, there's a lot of this in, in Greek myth. So Minos, once he discovered what had happened, was horrified, and in fury, uh, he imprisoned Daedalus in a tower. Keeping the brilliant genius captive proved impossible, however. Daedalus used wax, wood, and feathers. He created two pairs of wings, one for himself and one for his son, Icarus. And you may uh, recognize the name Icarus uh, from certain popular culture references. Uh, they used these wings to escape the tower and fly away overseas. However, Icarus became too bold in his excitement, and despite his father's warning, he flew c too close to the sun. The sun's heat melted the wax, which held his wings together, and he plummeted to his death by the sea. The grief-stricken Daedalus made his way to the Greek mainland, where he quickly hid himself. Meanwhile, the Minotaur had grown up to a fearsome flesh-eating monster, and Minos wisely had it imprisoned in the maze beneath his palace. When his only son, uh, Androgeus, was killed in a battle against Athens, he was so torn up with grief and hatred that he demanded a terrible tribute. Every nine years, fourteen young Athenians were to be sent to Crete and fed to the Minotaur. Um, and this is where the story really gets interesting. So let's take a look at the next slide, where we'll see a floor plan of this wonderful palace and learn a little bit more about the myth of the labyrinth. Here we're looking at a floor plan of the, the Palace of Knossos, and as you look at it, you might begin to understand where this might have fed into the myth of the labyrinth. It certainly looks labyrinthine, uh, with all the twisting halls and intersections. Uh, to continue the story, the son of King Aegis of Athens, Prince Theseus, was so appalled that he volunteered to go as one of the fourteen tributes to try to slay the monster himself. 
Uh, of course, his father was very afraid for his son. Before the black-sailed ship carrying the youths left for Crete, he told sailors that when they returned, they were, hoist, they were to hoist white sails if Theseus survived, and keep them black if he had been killed. When Theseus arrived in Crete, Minos's daughter, Ariadne, saw him among the victims and immediately fell in love with him. And that, by the way, also happens a lot in Greek myth. When she, she said she would help him defeat the Minotaur if he would promise to take her home and marry her. He agreed, and she gave him a magical ball of twine to guide him through the maze where the Minotaur lurked. With the help of the twine, much which unwound before him to show him the way, he soon found the beast, and after a long and fierce battle, he finally killed it. Following the path marked by the twine, he and the other Athenians got out of the maze safely and alive. They escaped the island by boat, taking Ariadne with them. However, on the way back to Athens, they stopped off at the Isle of Naxos, uh, remember Naxos is up in the Cyclades, where the ungrateful Theseus abandoned her. Uh, realizing she'd been deceived, the young woman cried to the gods for vengeance. So Theseus, um, he basically betrays Ariadne, leaves her behind, says, you know what, I'm not going to marry you after all. Uh, so this causes bad things. She cries out to the gods for vengeance. She was heard by the god Dionysus, who instantly fell in love with her and made her uh, his wife. Um, and with the help of her husband then the god Dionysus, Ariadne got her revenge on Theseus by making him forget to change the sails from black to white as he returned home. King Aegeus saw the black-sailed ship and was consumed by grief, thinking his son was dead. In despair, he threw himself into the sea and drowned. Today, we still call that stretch of water where he killed himself the Aegean Sea. Um, so you can see, even the geographical names of this region come from mythology. So some sort of passing familiarity with these mythological tales are, are actually important to understanding the region. Um, I'll wrap this up by telling you that Theseus' troubles did not end there. After the death of his first wife, uh, Hippolyte, he married Phaedra, the second daughter of King Minos. Phaedra was very jealous of the love he bore his son by Hippolyte, Hippolytus. She accused Hippolytus of attacking her, and Theseus was so angry uh, that he asked Poseidon to punish the young man. One day, when Hippolytus was diving his, uh, driving his chariot along the beach, Poseidon sent a great wave which terrified the horses into bolting. The chariot crashed and Hippolytus was killed. When Theseus discovered that Phaedra had lied to him, he was furious. The terrified woman hanged herself to escape his wrath. Uh, so we don't know what happened to King Minos himself, or whether he ever had time uh, to visit Margaret... Uh, let me try to get this name right. Uh, Makari Agalos. Uh, we know that his legend lives on to this day. Visitors to Crete can still visit Knossos, the fabulous Minoan palace where these adventures are said to have taken place. Um, so I hope you'll forgive my little diversion there to tell you that story. Uh, but it's a really fantastic story and so indicative of the love and betrayal and all of the things that happen uh, in, in Greek mythology. Uh, and it's important to remember that these Greek mythological stories have origins. They didn't just appear. Uh, Greeks are constructing these stories in reaction to the things that they experience. Natural phenomenon, man-made phenomenon, of when they travel to Crete long after the Minoan civilization has faded, they're finding these ruins. And they already have a few ideas of myths and gods and goddesses, and they're trying to make these ruins fit in with that world view. And that's where we get this wonderful story of Minos and Theseus and Ariadne. Um, so to come back to the image, though, you can see a number of things here are, are labeled with numbers, where we have many staircases, porches, central courts, um, sanctuaries, storage areas. Uh, it's a very complex palace. So this is where the royal family would have lived, where they would have worked, where they would have received visitors, where offerings would have been made. So a very important structure to the social hierarchy of Crete. So as we move away from the mythology and start looking at the actual places themselves, this is a stairway in the residential quarter of the Palace of Knossos, um, where we can see a bit of the structure 
of how this place was put together. Uh, it's sort of a large, rather spiral-looking staircase that winds up. And I'll point your attention to the columns that you see, these very distinctive red and black columns uh, that are narrower at the base than they are at the capital. Um, so they have a very unique and distinctive look to them. What, what we do know about those columns is that they did become sort of a distinctive characteristic of Minoan architecture. Other places aren't using columns like this. Uh, and that it would become a symbol of Minoan culture itself. Um, so we'll see these columns throughout most of these palaces. They're very common. We'll see lots of symbols and paintings also done in the palaces. So we'll take a look at some of the frescoes that we find in this area, in, in Knossos and in other parts of Crete. Um, we do know that they used a mineral-based pigments uh, to paint on the plaster walls, thus it's a, a fresco in that regard. Um, what we seem to see take focus in, the, in Minoan art are scenes from everyday life, uh, court behaviors. Um, there does not seem to be much of an emphasis on funeral rituals or burial procedures, at least not that we can decipher from their works. Uh, so a different kind of focus than things we've seen, say, in ancient Egypt, for example. This is a fragment piece that we have. Um, a fragment of fresco, what we have here is about 10 inches high. And what I want us to pay attention to again is the abstraction of the figures, the way they're being represented. Here we have a woman with a rather elaborate uh, hairdo, coiffure. Uh, we want to notice that she's presented in profile and the way that the eyes and the face are constructed, these sort of frontal eyes and a profile face with this wide staring look which is also something we saw back in the ancient Mesopotamian uh, and it is also something we saw in ancient Egypt as well. So there's definitely something about the symbol of the open eyes in a frontal arrangement uh, that seems to be very important to many different uh, cultures in the region. Uh, so be thinking about that, about why different cultures seem to key in on the symbol of the eye and what that might represent for them respectively. So this is a very famous piece, well-known piece from Knossos. Uh, it's what's called the bow leaping fresco, or sometimes called the Toreador fresco. Uh, and it's approximately 2 feet 8 inches high, uh, including the border, so it's not a monumental piece. And you're going to notice that there are some inconsistencies in the coloration. Uh, this is a reconstruction. Uh, so there's been some heavy restoration to the piece. So we always have to keep that in mind anytime we're looking at restored pieces. It may not be a hundred percent accurate, uh, but for our intents and purposes we're, we're just going to take it uh, as we see it and, and assume that it's more or less accurate to how it was originally done. Uh, it's a very fascinating piece, beautifully done, uh, lots of movement and vitality. So what we're going to see here, we have two figures on either side of a bowl one seems to be clasping the horns of the bull. The other is towards the back uh, behind the bull. And then we see a, a third figure doing some sort of a flip or somersault over the back of the bull. Um, <clears throat> now, we believe that this had some sort of uh, important religious significance. And this was a ritual that involved the bulls and veneration of the bulls. Uh, we mentioned before that the sacrifice of bulls was an important part of uh, religious ritual in the region. Uh, they didn't leave, the, the Minoans didn't leave very many temples behind. Religious worship tended to be in the out of doors, uh, not inside of temples. Um, so there are a few things going on that we might suppose from this. We believe that this is a representation of something that may have actually happened as a part of a ritual venerating the bull. Uh, where a youth, like the young person in the middle there, uh, would have been in an arena, some sort of a closure of some type, 
uh, perhaps a bit like a modern rodeo, but instead of just trying to ride on the back of a bull, uh, the idea would be to run straight towards the bull, time your jump just right to leap over the back of the bull, uh, do some sort of flip, and then land behind the bull. Um, pretty remarkable feat if you could do it without being killed by the animal. Uh, this may have been some kind of rite of passage. Uh, you proved, uh, let's say if this is a, a boy, a young man doing this, uh, a way of proving your manliness or as a rite of passage into adulthood. Uh, and I want to bring up the gender distinction here uh, as we look at the obviously different colors of the figures. The two on either side of the bowl are a light color. The one on top of the bowl ha has a dark coloration. Um, now it's not uncommon in this region and in other parts of the world for there to be a sort of color coding of males and females. In many cases we see that females will be depicted with lighter skin tones and males will be depicted with, with darker skin tones. So that is perhaps what we're seeing here. Now we don't have a lot of written documentation to back that up, uh, to really solidify that interpretation but it is supported by other visual evidence. So that may be what we're seeing here. Uh, and in the next image, I have a slightly closer up view that I'll let you look at, though I don't, uh, I don't think we'll have anything to say about it. In addition to frescoes that deal with bulls and bull leaping and those sorts of activities, we also get a great many like this. Uh, this is simply a landscape. It's sometimes called the spring fresco. Um, and it comes from about 1650 BCE. Uh, at its tallest, it's about seven and a half feet tall. And as you can see, it wraps around the entire room. This piece is very well preserved, um, and we're seeing it in a very good original state. Uh, in this city, Thera, there was a massive volcanic eruption that covered the entire city in volcanic ash, which was obviously quite bad for the residents, but good for us because it completely sealed up and preserved these paintings that probably otherwise would not have survived intact. Um, so as we take a look at this piece, we want to note how brightly colored it is, the variety of colors and forms. It seems to be entirely a springtime landscape uh, subject matter. We don't see any human figures. We don't see any bulls or any other sort of sacred creature. There are birds flying around, so we do see some really beautiful, nice, stylistic representations of birds. As far as we can tell, this had a primarily decorative function. Uh, this was a nice way to decorate the interior of, uh, of a home, of a room, um, to bring some life and some color into the interior space. Uh, and it may not have had any sort of particular ritual or religious function beyond the decorative. Uh, but really beautiful piece. I absolutely adore the contour lines, the really beautiful, smooth, curvilinear shapes of the flowers and the birds. Uh, it all comes together very nicely. In addition to wall painting and frescoes, the Minoans also had a rich tradition of pottery and making things from clay. Uh, we'll just take a quick look at a couple of examples of that. This is from a decorative period we call the marine style, so-called because the pots tend to be decorated with marine subject matter, fish and whatnot. Uh, this piece here is uh, a Kamara Square jar, and it's a little over a foot high to give us a sense of the scale. And we see a really nice representation of water and fish uh, over the top of it. Um, the decoration may have had something to do with what was stored inside of here. Perhaps this is an indication that this was a water vessel. Perhaps it was used to transport fish. Um, obviously, living on, a, on an island, the Minoans were quite adept fishermen. Um, but it's a very nice... Uh, limited chromatic decoration. 
Uh, these would have been produced in great numbers, great, great quantities. Uh, and as we look at a couple more examples here from Crete, you'll want to keep these in mind as when we get to mainland Greece and we start looking at the production of vases and different kinds of pottery in mainland Greece. There will be some influences being drawn there. Along the same lines, we have this wonderful marine-style octopus jar, uh, also from Crete, dated to about 1500 BCE. It's about 11 inches high. Uh, as you can see, it's a great big round jug, and I absolutely love the octopus on there. Just love the style of representation. Um, <clears throat> what we're seeing on the surface is this wonderful monochromatic piece. Um, what we in modern language might call cartoonish, uh, almost a whimsical look at an op octopus as its tentacles move entirely around and embrace the jug from all sides. We see in between the tentacles little floating pieces of seaweed uh, and little debris from the ocean. And again, what we think is primarily just a decorative piece. This is uh, not necessarily endemic of any sort of ritual function. Uh, or any religious significance uh, purely as a decorative piece to make this more visually appealing uh, to the people using it. We'll end our look at the Minoans with a quick look at this piece which is quite different. This is called the Harvester Vase uh, and it dates from about 1500 BCE. It's not painted, it's carved. Uh, and its widest diameter, it's only about five inches. Uh, so we see this overall view where we can see a group of harvesters going out into the field. They have their, uh, their tools over their shoulders. They're lined up. Some of them have their mouths open and their chests are enlarged, uh, much like they're taking a deep breath. And uh, one theory is that this is showing men at work singing. They're singing a song as they go out into the field and they're going to harvest the grain and bring it back. So it's a very small piece. So it's going to have lim limited functionality. This may have been something that had a more important uh, ritual or symbolic function. Um, perhaps it was just a decorative piece. Its limited size though is going to give it a very limited functionality as a storage vessel uh, or a drinking vessel though. Um, so it's unique in that regard. There's some beautiful detail in there. We're still seeing a lot of the same kind of abstraction with simplified geometric shapes of the body. Uh, expressiveness in the face certainly. Uh, we have frontal eyes on profile heads. Uh, so again that same trend towards abstracting the body in that way continues even in this unique piece. Now we'll move on to the third culture that we're looking at in the ancient Aegean, the Mycenaeans. Mycenaeans are named after the city of Mycenae, which was the home of the legendary king Agamemnon, who led the Greeks in the Trojan War. Uh, this is another instance where we have mythology being uh, being influenced by historical people and events. The story, the the Greek epic story of the Trojan War is half legend, half historically accurate. Um, let's get a little bit of background here. Uh, the Mycenaeans are a rather warlike group of people who conquered Crete, the Minoans, around 1450 BCE. Mycenae, the city, is the site in Greece located about 90 kilometers southwest of Athens in the northeastern Peloponnese. It's in the second millennium BCE that Mycenae was one of the major centers of Greek civilization. They were a military stronghold that dominated much of southern Greece. The period of Greek history from about 1600 BCE to about 1100 BCE is called Mycenaean uh, in reference to this city. Um, so if you're interested in the mythology here, I'm not going to tell this whole story like I did with Minos. Uh, it can be found in the uh, Iliad, which describes the last year of the war, and the Odyssey, 
which is the 10-year voyage home after the war. Um, these were a big part, these stories are a big part of Greek culture uh, and inform a lot of the ideas about culture and the art that comes out of it. Um, but let's take a look then at some of the places we associate in the type of architecture and art we associate with Mycenaean culture. Here's an aerial view of the ruins of Tyrans in Greece, uh, which was a Mycenaean citadel type structure. Um, this is where we're going to see our first instances of extremely well fortified citadels. Uh, as you can see, Tyrans here had a central city structure that we can see within the walled city. There would have been areas for the palace and the government, uh, a marketplace, a place for people to live, of course. Uh, and then you see this enormously thick wall that built up around it. The city itself, much like Mycenae itself, was probably built on a natural plateau, rocky outcropping that was already there. Uh, they simply built up walls and built up their city on top of that rocky plateau. Now the reason we're seeing the Mycenaeans have such emphasis on defense and walls and these sorts of structures, they were quite militaresque. Um, and as I mentioned, they went out and they conquered uh, Crete. They conquered the Minoans. Uh, they were reaching out. They were involved in that Trojan War, reaching across the Aegean over into Asia Minor. Uh, so they were quite aggressive militarily. When you're a very military, mil militarily aggressive culture, uh, you have to expect a certain amount of reprisal. People may try to turn against you. That means you need good defenses as well. And that's a bit of what we're seeing here with the fortifications at Tyrans. Uh, now some of the construction techniques that they're able to use are also quite unique and quite interesting. So let's take a, a look at uh, how they're putting these walls together in some cases. Here's a look at a corbelled gallery in the walls of the citadel at Tyrans uh, to give us a sense of how this is built. Um, these passageways aren't terribly tall, maybe about five to six feet tall. Uh, there are corbelled arches, and your book can describe a little bit better and show you a diagram of what we mean by corbelled. Um, and I do want to draw your attention to the materials being used. These are large stones uh, that are being stacked on top of each other. There's no mortar, there's nothing uh, holding these together the way we might think of a brick wall today being held together. That's all just friction. Uh, very large stones stacked on top of each other with smaller stones in the gaps between to try to lock them into place. This is some very impressive architecture. When you consider the, the tons and tons of stone, very large stones. Uh, you can see some of the stones in this image are two, three, four feet uh, square. Um, they would have been incredibly heavy, hundreds of pounds to lift and move. Um, there's a term that the Greeks, the uh, sort of classical Greeks that came after the Mycenaeans, again, like in on, Gre on Crete, uh, they were looking at this architecture long after the civilization had collapsed and were trying to make sense of it, trying to figure out, uh, well, how are these things built? How are these massive rocks moved? Uh, and they came up with a term called Cyclopean. And they believed, the ancient Greeks believed, uh, that the only way that such large structures, such big walls could have been constructed were by uh, the Cyclops, which are mythological creatures, you've probably heard of them before, giants with one eye. Um, and so the ancient Greeks thought that these were citadels built by the Cyclops and called it Cyclopean because of that. Now, we today don't think that the Cyclops built them. This was just good old human engineering and, and uh, power here. Uh, but it is immensely impressive. Uh, and another influence, uh, another instance of how the ancient Greeks are using their environment around them and using their mythology to try to explain what they're seeing and experience.
Here's a plan of the citadel at Tiran's to give us a sense, a little bit better sense of how this is put together. You'll notice the Megaron that's shaded in the middle of this plan. That was the central building, uh, the government palace, right in the center of the city. Uh, the little dotted line that comes up the approach lamp ramp through the main gate gives us an indication if you were trying to enter Tyrion's this is how you'd have to get in this is the only way you could march an army or any sort of invasion force up and you can see that it's built in such a way that there are several bottlenecks and right hand or excuse me uh, and several blind turns that you would have to make in order to get into the city proper at all um, this of course is by design it's to make it difficult for intruders to get in it's to create those those bottlenecks uh, so that uh, defenders of the city could pour their boiling oil and shoot arrows down into them. Uh, these things were very very highly guarded uh, and very well protected by these by this architectural structure. The walls that the Mycenaeans constructed were sometimes decorated at the gates, as we see here, this line gate. This is in the city of Mycenae. Uh, these are limestone bricks, and again, you get a sense of how large they are. To try to give us a sense of scale, the relief panel, where you see the two lines on either side of a column, that's about nine and a half feet tall. So use that as sort of to determine how big everything else is in this image. Um, so the walls uh, you can see are engaged with that panel, that triangular panel that I just mentioned is called a relief panel. Uh, it's a little bit thinner and not quite as heavy as the massive massive blocks that surround it as you can see. That relief panel is on top of a lintel which, pre which presents the passageway in through the wall. Um, it's called a relief panel because it's a little thinner and it's a little bit lighter, even though it's still quite large. It relieves some of the weight that's pressing down on the lintel. If we just tried to put these big blocks and continue the wall across the top of there, more likely than not, the weight of those massive blocks would just crack that lintel in two um, and the whole structure would collapse. So we are seeing a concern here about weight and gravity and how to actually make uh, these expanses work um, architecturally. Um, let me give you a closer up view of that relief panel so we can talk a little bit more about it. Here's an alternate view where we see a little bit more close up. And what we're going to notice here, what you probably see right away, is that the lions no longer have heads on them. Uh, the lions' heads were carved separately and were attached to the face of the relief panel by dowels. So over the centuries those have been lost to us, but it would have given the lions a much more three-dimensional effect. So you could imagine the fearsome faces of these lions coming out and away, looking down at people uh, as they enter through this gate would have been quite a neat effect. So we've already mentioned the relief panel and what, it's, what it does architecturally. Uh, this is carved out of limestone. That lintel that, there's, that it's on top of, that I mentioned before, weighs approximately 25 tons and is almost 10 feet high. Uh, it's an immense stone and there's still a lot of speculation on how they were even able to get a stone of that size up into position. Um, there's a lot about this. We're not entirely sure how they actually constructed it, the engineering of it. Um, I do also want to point out on the relief panel, the two lions, they are flanking a Minoan column. We saw those columns at the Palace of Knossos. So the Mycenaeans, who had conquered the Minoans on Crete, uh, are using some of the symbols of Crete and using some of the symbols from a known culture and appropriating it uh, into their own artwork. So a very interesting cross-cultural communication we see going on here. The Mycenaeans also had some pretty elaborate burial sites, uh, as we're going to see with this entrance. This is a royal burial site that is associated with the ruler Atreus, who was an ancestor of the legendary Agamemnon. Um, you'll notice that the title we have on this is the Treasury of Atreus at Mycenae. Uh, that's a little bit of a misnomer, we think. Uh, one of the 
uh, archaeologists who initially excavated this site. Um, at first, when he was digging it up and he saw all these golden artifacts and all these wonderful pieces, thought that this might be a treasury, a storehouse of, of wealth and goods for a king. Um, we now have determined that this wasn't necessarily a treasury per se, but it is in fact a burial place, and that they did bury their dead with precious items. Again, not unusually. Uh, we've certainly seen many other cultures that do that as well. What we're looking at here is what's called the dromos, the path that leads up into the actual burial site. Um, it's a constructed brick site in a big dome. I'll show you an interior shot here in just a second. But then it would be covered up with dirt and plants and nature would just be allowed to sort of grow over it. So it's a bit like a man-made hill. Uh, so it creates its own subterranean structure for us to have our burial mound. Here we are inside that burial chamber, uh, and it is an immense chamber. It's approximately 43 feet high, uh, and the dome is approximately 48 feet in diameter. Again, we're seeing these very large bricks being stacked together uh, in a very intricate manner to keep the structural integrity intact. Um, it is an unsupported span, and I do want to make that clear. This is a true dome. There are no supports, no columns, no cross beams. Uh, it is only the engineering of this masonry that's keeping this dome intact. Now that is significant uh, because we will not see a span of this size, a dome, unsupported this size again until we get to ancient Rome. Uh, and there are significant advances in uh, engineering. Uh, so this is quite an astounding achievement for this time period. Now let's go look at one of the objects that were found in places like this. So this is a funerary mask that we find in Mycenae. It's made out of gold that has been beaten to a thin sheet and then embossed with the image of a face that you see here. Um, now some books call this the Mask of Agamemnon, and this is another instance of names that we know are not quite accurate, but uh, they just sort of stick. Um, Schliemann, who I mentioned before, one of the major archaeologists uh, for the Aegean, uh, Schliemann called this Agamemnon. He's the one who discovered this piece, dug it up out of its burial place, looked at it, and he thought, I am looking at the face of the legendary Agamemnon. Uh, and he was convinced that this was the face of Agamemnon, which makes a great story, but isn't quite accurate. We can now date this to about 1600 to 1500 BCE. The Trojan War would have been about 1300 to 1200 BCE. Um, so this is not Agamemnon. Uh, this is not him. Regardless, though, it's still a magnificent piece and a really interesting piece. So they had access to gold and the ability to refine it and... Uh, thin it out into these flat plates. Boy, the way we're seeing it here, it's been flattened out over the centuries as it's been laying flat on a, on display. Uh, it would have had a much more rounded look originally. Probably this was intended to be over the face of our deceased ruler, so it would have taken the, the conforms, the shape of the face. Uh, so you can imagine those ears laying back down on the sides of the head over where the actual ears would have been. So even though this is laying over the face of our ruler, we'll notice that it's still highly stylized. Um, it's not exactly uh, a likeness or representational. Um, we see a highly stylized face. The eyes, importantly, are closed, which is quite interesting. Um, we see lots of emphasis in the beard, in the ears, and little details like that that are really quite astounding. This most likely had something to do with an important burial ritual closing of the eyes and putting the, this desk, death mask on top of the corpse. Um, we don't have a lot of documentation or written records or anything to really put all of the pieces together to know exactly what the symbolic function of this would have been. Um, not terribly dissimilar from what we've already looked at in ancient Egypt. The use of golden death masks on our leaders was quite common there. So quite possibly uh, 
some sort of similarity in terms of why we think it's necessary to adorn our leaders after death in this way. Objects like this are also found in these burial sites in Mycenae. Uh, this is a dagger. It's quite elaborate, inlaid with a lion hunt scene that you can see. Uh, it's dated to about 1600 to 1500 BCE. It's made out of bronze, inlaid with gold, silver, and yellow, which is a type of local found uh, ore. It's about 9 inches long, so do keep that in mind. This whole thing uh, is only 9 inches long. You can see it's only the center piece that has the decoration. So much of this decoration you see is less than an inch high, and yet there's some beautiful detail, really fantastic detail in there. Because it's so delicately done and so precisely done, uh, we believe that this was a ritual blade or a decorative blade, perhaps used to show status in society, and not something that you would have used for practical applications. Nobody was cutting their meat with this blade. Um, this wasn't something that would have been used functionally, but may have been, as I said, an indication of status uh, or used for some ritualistic function. Uh, I do encourage you to take a closer look at this. Um, try to zoom in if you can. Uh, I know YouTube is not the best forum for that. Uh, if you even wanted to just type this into Google and try to find some close-up images on Google search, you should be able to find some. There is some great detail in here. And when you think about the craftsmanship and the skill that goes into creating something on this miniature level with such fantastic detail. Again, and this is something I've mentioned in previous weeks, this already tells us so much about the society. We have skilled metal workers uh, who have been trained in this craft, who have been probably apprentices, who have masters who trained them to do this. The fact that we have a society with the Mycenaeans that allows for that level of training and expertise uh, is already indicating to us so much about the social structure and strata of this society, that we have access to these sorts of precious materials, that we can use these precious materials for objects like this, and that we have a base of skill and craftsmanship to create these objects uh, is really quite astounding when you, when you consider the time period, the level of technology, and what we're working with here. So I'll leave you this week with a few questions that you might want to consider um, and jot down a few notes. This is also some things that may help you with your writing assignment and any of our online discussion boards. Um, be thinking about possible functions of the Cycladic sculptures. We know a little bit about where they're from, but we don't know a lot about how they were used. Uh, based on what we've learned so far in this course, in comparing to other cultures, what might we suppose the possible functions are for those figurines? Also be thinking about how you might compare Old Kingdom and New Kingdom Egyptian art from, say, like the Armana period, to styles of wall paintings in the Minoan culture. Uh, there are some interesting differences and some differencing, different uh, interesting parallels between those things. Um, and try to figure and look at the focus of Minoan art. Um, did they seem to have an emphasis on the afterlife, the way that we see the Mycenaeans or the Cycladics seem to have, or the Egyptians or many of these other cultures we've looked at uh, in this course? So keep these questions in mind. These are things you'll need to be thinking about uh, and trying to figure out how you want to articulate responses to. So this week's lecture was, of course, uh, a bit shorter than the last couple of weeks. Uh, we will have a little bit of variety in the length uh, of the lectures. I'm trying not to make them too terribly long, but sometimes we just have a lot of ground to cover, and I'll try to do it as efficiently as possible. So as always, if you have any questions or concerns or troubles, uh, feel free to email me, and I'll try to get back to you as soon as I possibly can. Uh, next week, we'll be looking at the ancient Greeks. Um, I'll try not to get too much in depth into the mythology, uh, except for when it's absolutely necessary to understanding the artworks themselves. So until next week, I'll talk at you later.